Attention students, we're about to begin our history lesson. <clears throat> Hello and welcome. I'm Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today I want to talk about the history and outcomes of various anti-Semitic stereotypes and canards. This is part two of my series, Echoes of Jewish Identity, and if you skipped the introduction, you can find it here, above, or down in the doobly-doo. All set? On with the lesson. Once upon a time, in Mesopotamia, there was an elderly couple named Abe and Sarah, and they had a son late in life. They named him Isaac. Now, Abe already had another son named Ishmael, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, Abe had this glorious vision that one day, all of Sarah's descendants would be chosen by God. And so, Abraham and his son Isaac, and Isaac and his son Jacob, and Jacob and his son Joseph, and so on and so forth, forever after, through all of time, they became the Jewish people, more or less, ish. The story of the Jewish people is one of discrimination and oppression, of being a people apart. We were monotheists in a world of polytheism. We were chosen people who bowed to no one in a land of kings and living gods. We were wanderers, a people without a homeland of our own for much of our history. Our first story of being subjugated comes at the hands of the Egyptians. Now, Joseph had moved all of his brethren there, but they had kept some of their own culture. Just as in modern day, a Catholic family might move into a Protestant neighborhood, but stay Catholic even as they became friends with their new neighbors, so too the Jewish people held on to their religion, even as they adapted to Egyptian culture. Eventually, over the generations, that maintenance of custom, that community within a community, the differences, led to discrimination, and discrimination led to subjugation, and subjugation led to enslavement. And by the time of Ramses II, the Jews were living in a tenemented ghetto, and Ramses decided that it was time to whittle those Jews down by genocide and had all of the baby boys killed. Do you want rebellion, Ramses? Because that's how you get rebellion. And indeed, in the next generation, under the leadership of Moses, the Jews did rise up and walk away from Egypt forever to go found their own homeland. They conquered a whole bunch of people. Israel was a fertile place in the deserts, a land of milk and honey, which means there were people living there. So, okay, maybe the Jews aren't always the targets of the violence? Anyway, they founded a kingdom there and lived for many generations. And other people saw that it was good and wanted to take a bite. So there was lots of fighting, conquest, reconquest, resettlement. It started in the... 8th century with King Sargon II of Assyria, and then again about two centuries later when Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II destroyed the first temple. It's a popular practice when trying to assimilate a group of conquered people to divide them up into smaller sections and resettle them all around your empire so that they're forced to fit in. Well, this didn't work too well on the Jewish people who had experienced this before, and their strong sense of religious identity combined with their adaptable social customs 
allowed them to hang on to their identities even as they were resettled in places like Babylon and Egypt and Greece and Rome. Oh, there was still plenty of dislike for them based on their differences. In the 5th century BCE in Persia, there was an attempted genocide. Reportedly, it was only halted by Xerxes I, the king, being seduced by the lovely Esther, a Jewish woman who gave herself so that the king would see that killing off all the Jews meant killing his wife. The Romans tried to force the Jews to worship their gods and emperors, and when met with refusal, frequently killed them. They tried sacking the second temple and doing that whole resettlement thing, but the Jews maintained their own identity even so. There were a number of Jewish rebellions, each one squashed by the Romans, and eventually Jews became a normal part of life in the Roman Empire those untrustworthy, poor, dirty heathens. Things got extra weird once that whole Christianity thing happened. Jesus, of course, was a Roman Jew. And he was an activist who wanted to improve both of those identities. He thought that the corrupt Romans and the Jews who had integrated a little bit too much into those parts of Roman society that weren't really good for people could use reforming, and he and his followers set out to form a new kind of Judaism which refocused on kindness and nonviolence and charity. In the centuries after his death, it was declared that Jesus had been the Messiah, a messenger from God come to save the world. This, in the end, is the crucial difference between Christianity and Judaism. Jews just don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so everything that follows from that is a little bit sus. As for the Romans, well, they persecuted the Christians quite harshly. And not because they cared that they'd split off from the Jews. Why would they care about that? It was because the Christians practiced all their worship behind closed doors. You could worship just about any way you wanted in the Roman Empire. You want to sacrifice a bunch of bulls? Go for it. You want to self-castrate on top of a mountaintop? We won't stop you. But if you're practicing in private, that must mean that you're doing something you don't want the government to see. Either you're fomenting rebellion, killing children, put a pin in that one, or both. Now, Jews, they're just gross little weirdos who only worship one god who doesn't even have a name or a statue. But Christians? They're hiding something. But eventually, Christianity won out and became the major religion of the Roman Empire and all its descendants. And that's where we start to get some really familiar stereotypes about Jews. In many ways, it all springs from one idea, that Jews were the ones responsible for the death of Jesus Christ, and therefore all of sin. After all, the Gospel of Matthew says that the Pharisees didn't ask for Jesus to be spared the crucifixion. But even if that's taken as gospel, that's one sect of Jews at one time in one place, and for some reason it lets the Romans off scot-free. After all, it was the Romans who regularly crucified people, and yes, they did this regularly. This was not a targeted punishment. It was the Romans who disliked Jesus' secretive religion and disruptive activities the Romans who arrested him and eventually killed him. But if you're a Roman Christian, well, you don't want to take the blame for that. So, if you believe that Jews are evil and it has marked them forever, what does that look like? 
while it's hard to pinpoint a precise evolution of anti-Semitic stereotypes and canards, most of what we think of today are things that were codified in medieval Europe, and therefore target Ashkenazi Jews. Your foremost popular parodic traits of the horrible Jew are red hair, a big nose, a glib tongue, and insatiable greed. All four of these traits remain popular today. I can't tell you where the nose came from, but red hair is a recessive trait, which means that within carrier populations it's going to be more common within groups that don't marry outside themselves so much. So people who are physically isolated, like the Irish, or people who are socially isolated, like the Jews. As for glib speech, well, I've mentioned before that Jewish culture generally fosters scholarship, friendly debate. It's common Jewish religious practice to study the Bible in groups, to commentate the holy texts, and even to give your own interpretations. This spreads out to other areas of Jewish life as well, and even people in the diaspora, like me, who were raised more secular but culturally Jewish, tend to form a habit of collaborative speaking, where you're encouraged to have your own voice, to speak your own opinions, and to talk with one another, collaboratively interrupting. This kind of speech pattern doesn't really lend itself to keeping our opinions silent or taking orders, much less to answering a complex question with a simple answer. And greed? Well, that was the Christian's own doing. You see, their Lord and Savior forbade the practice of usury, or charging interest on lending money. Since in this economy there was still a great need for money lending, but no one would do it without a profit to be made, that left a gap that someone needed to fill. In an environment where Jews were actively prevented from competing with their Christian counterparts in many areas of business, well, usually money lending and banking were often the only places where they could make a living. So they did. But money is a tricky thing, and nobody likes to pay interest on a loan. In time, a society that was already primed to see the outsider as evil, came to associate the ills of the profession with the character of the people who had been forced into it. But these are only the most benign of the things I have to tell you. In about 400 CE, Saint Jerome began on his life's work, a translation of both the Old Testament and the New into a Latin Vulgate, something that all of the people would be able to read so that they could take in the words of God for themselves. Translation is a little bit slippery, though, and when he was translating from the Hebrew description of Moses, there's one particular word that seems to have given him some trouble. There are two good translations of this word, depending on their context. Most scholars would use the word here for a ray of light, a, a corona, a, a halo. But St. Jerome translated it quite technically correctly as horns. We don't know whether this was an innocent mistake, but we do know from his own words 
that Jerome believed that the whole Jewish race was stained forever with the blood of Christ. By medieval times, those horns were being depicted quite literally. Mostly in depictions of Moses, even the most famous, but there was a suspicion that even the most ordinary everyday Jew was walking around hiding something sinister behind a hat or a veil. It doesn't take much imagination to go from this image to that of the Christian devil. So not only were Jews greedy, ugly, oily little weasels, but they were in bed with the devil himself? Spare me, yes to. Jews were certainly believed to at least have magic. You see, among all of those pesky, arbitrary rules in the Old Testament that most Christians no longer followed, there were a number of prohibitions on food and prescribed rituals that honestly did a lot to keep Jews safe from various plagues and calamities. Kosher foods excluded things like shellfish, pork, blood, things which might go bad easily or contain parasites. And some of those rituals were things like washing your hands before a meal, including a little song so you know how long to rinse. These preventative measures kept Jews as a population largely free from a lot of the diseases that hit Europeans the worst, including the Black Plague. And when you have any population that seems certainly not unaffected, but less affected by something like that, you have a natural-born scapegoat. It was easy then to imagine that Jews had caused those diseases, either by mundane poisons in the water, or by magical intercourse with the devil. And it's a short step from there to blood libel. What's blood libel? Why, human sacrifice, of course. <coughs> Remember how I said that if the Romans couldn't see what you were doing in your worship, they assumed you must be, I don't know, killing innocents, for instance? Well, I wasn't exaggerating. As early as the first century CE, they had rumors that there were Jews who were keeping good Gentile citizens captive and killing and eating them in a ritual once a year. Of course, these rumors were false, and logically, they had to know it. After all, the very first stories of Abraham, patriarch of the religion, forbade human sacrifice, and the kosher laws made consumption of human flesh and blood anathema. Besides, it was very hypocritical of the Greeks, since their most famous story tells of a father sacrificing his own daughter just so he can sail to war. In any case, those rumors never managed to quite die out in Christendom, and there were accusations here and there of Jews using Christian blood as either a magic item or a medicine. The specific incident that became blood libel itself didn't happen until 1144. A young Christian boy was found stabbed to death in the woods near Easter in an English parish. One Thomas of Monmouth, in writing of his life and supposed tragic death, blamed the incident on a cabal of Jews performing a once-a-year ritual in which they recreated the crucifixion and then used the boy's blood in their Passover matzah. This horrific idea that Jews perform some perverted and satanic version of communion, that instead of the metaphorical body and blood of Christ, they consume the actual blood of Christians, is still around to this day. 
many anti-Semitic groups and fringe political organizations take it up as fact. In fact, there was an incident in 2005 where a Russian nationalist group blamed the gruesome death of two young girls on the local Hasidic community. And as recently as last year, there was a painting unveiled in the Italian art scene where a Christian martyr was depicted as being sacrificed by a cabal of Jews. And that's not the worst of it. Many Arabic language sources, not all of them small, take blood libel as fact. And there are persistent rumors of organ harvesting in the Gaza Strip, either for the black market or for religious purposes. Many of them have the attitude that the Israelis kill Palestinians not for land or power, but for sacrifice. This is adding an extra layer of terrible danger and misunderstanding in an already volatile political situation. But association with the devil and anti-Christian bias also had more subtle outcomes. For instance, in about the 13th century CE, we start hearing a story of a Jew who mocked Jesus on his way to crucifixion and was subsequently cursed to wander the earth until Jesus' second coming. This story of the wandering Jew associated Jews who might travel from one area to another as they were kicked out with ill omen. All across Europe, the reputation of the Jewish people as harbingers of doom, as Satanists, as magicians, led to a lot of fear. And that led to the horrors of expulsion and inquisition. People even suspected of being of Jewish heritage, hey, people with red hair, regardless of their heritage, were sometimes taken up and subject to dispossession, exile, oppression, torture. People generally think of the Spanish Inquisition, but it was hardly the only one. It's even arguable that the Holocaust was a slightly more secular version of the same thing. The scapegoating of the Jewish population for all of society's ills is neither new nor vanished. It's happened so many times over our history that deep down I think that anyone with a connection to Judaism has to have some small part of fear that the Holocaust won't be the last even as we say, never again. Because, you see, we are still getting all of these things. They never went away. And some of it is probably more subtle than you expect. So what are these potentially subtle and yet still popular and dangerous forms? Well, what about that idea of the big-nosed, ugly, or even inhuman banker or merchant? That couldn't possibly be a common stereotype to this day, especially in children's media now, could it? Oh. How about everyday innocuous language? Take, for instance, some popular song lyrics? Or even less blatantly, what about the phrase to Jew someone down, as in to haggle? Someone actually used that at a member of my family once, without ever having thought about the implications. Okay, okay, but those are probably, or at least plausibly, accidents. And if some child grows up thinking that bankers are often ugly, big-nosed little men, but doesn't know that means Jew, well, that's probably not going to get anybody killed. 
But a belief in lizard people might. That's right, the butt of jokes, the semi-fictional, semi-real conspiracy theory was made up by a horrific anti-Semite who might actually believe that Jews are secretly lizard people trying to control the world. And if somebody genuinely believes that you are not human, well, there's no telling what they'll do. Next up is the belief in the magical Jew, the satanic Jew, the wandering Jew. In their more modern outcomes, these have largely gotten tangled together and the outcomes are a little bit less on the nose, but they are still a problem. One other note on this subsection, a lot of things you'll hear here are the same sort of discrimination you'll hear against the Romani peoples. Now, Jews and the Roma are not the same, although they can and do overlap, but in many ways they've been discriminated against in the same ways. They've both been repeatedly cast out of their homes, wandered around without a homeland sometimes, been discriminated against long term, especially in Europe, and both were primary targets of the Holocaust. So while not everything is the same for both groups, some of these stereotypes will sound familiar to you. If you'd like to see me do a deeper dive into Romani issues, uh, leave me a comment or um, shoot me a note on Twitter and I'll see what I can do. So as to the mystical Jew stereotype, like I said, this tends to be a little bit more subtle. Nobody's ever asked me if they could see my horns, though I have been asked if I worship the devil. Anyway, what this stereotype tends to come out to is media representations of a Jew as a sinister or mysterious force, someone who uses magic. This shows up in lots of fantasy and magical realism. The two instances that come to mind for me are Fanny and Alexander and uh, Guy Gabriel Kay's The Lions of El Rasan, but I couldn't possibly list all the times I've seen it. These stereotypes are just the same for the Roma and just as wrong in both cases. Hand in hand with the magical Jew trope is the seductively pretty young Jewess. And yes, this is basically the only time you'll hear somebody who's ever met a Jew use the term Jewess. Anyway, there's this idea that as ugly and off-putting as the men and older women are meant to be, sometimes the young female Jews will be shown as seductive, using an older kind of magic to lead good Christian boys into temptation and sin. See previous comparison to the Roma, and also, seriously, unless she's trying to prevent a genocide, Xerxes, it's probably not happening. And no, I don't want your number. No, I don't want to give you mine. No, I'm not going to meet you nowhere. No, I don't want none of your time. Then there's the exoticism around Jewish mysticism. Numerology and the Kabbalah get sort of taken up by these celebrities and white people who just find it cool. They have no faith base or history or connection to the spiritual meaning of these practices, they just take them up as some kind of toy. And while this isn't as widespread as something like, say, smudging with white sage, which is actively driving the plant extinct so that the tribes who need it for their actual spiritual practices no longer have access, it's still not great. This isn't exclusive to Western cultures, either. There's a lot of appropriation of Abrahamic iconography in, say, Japanese anime, although that may also be spurred by Ultraman, which was created by somebody with a Christian faith. But any marginalized group can tell you that having the majority culture pick up the trappings of their sacred beliefs is 
not a happy experience. Jews have been persecuted over these practices in specific, and so to have Gentiles take them up to ooh and ah over, well, that's where it crosses the line into problematic appropriation. And now, we're going to have to talk about the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. The Protocols are a piece of czarist propaganda created by the literal Russian secret police in the early 20th century. It, of course, purports to be edited from the notes on a real meeting of Jewish elders, but we know that it was primarily created by one Sergei Nilus, uh, apologies if I've mispronounced his name, and uh, a band of other co-editors. This piece of propaganda is the origin of the specific claim that Jews are fomenting rebellion against the governments they live under in order to perpetuate a kind of white genocide and take all the power for themselves. It creates this conspiracy known as international Jewry, which does not exist. It doesn't exist. Okay. But it says that international Jewry is using techniques of poison, manipulation of the lesser races, Ugh. undermining the moral fiber of the societies they live in and using their vast wealth and control over the media to basically make the world so unstable that they can just take it over. It should be pretty obvious by now where all of these accusations come from. They're just a dressed up version of the same old stereotypes coming out to play. The glib speech of media, Satanism and seduction, greed as if Jews are some kind of evil dragon trying to hoard it all to themselves. This was intended to make a very believable lure to throw revolutionaries off the scent of the people actually oppressing them, the czars and aristocracy of Russia. This was created to stymie the communist revolution in Russia, but it was very popular and quickly got translated into other world languages. It became a staple of white nationalism and other hyper-nationalist cultures. We know that it was a favorite of Hitler's. After all, what better way to increase your grip of fear on the populace than to give them this straw man, based on a people they already hate, of an actual conspiracy out to kill you. I said before that this is one of the core pillars of American white supremacy, and I wasn't kidding. The Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan Nations, both believe this poppycock and use it as centered in their ideology. The Proud Boys, the alt-right, you can hear them chanting, Jews will not replace us. You can watch their videos about white genocide and international Jewry. And there are plenty of ordinary people who've never heard of the protocols, but they've heard of international Jewry. They don't know that Jews are a diaspora, not a conspiracy. And it's easy for them to believe that Jews are the ones hoarding a disproportionate amount of the wealth and media influence in America, even though we can clearly see that it's not. But this is what drives a lot of right-wing distrust of mainstream news of Hollywood and non-Christian music. And this propaganda is where communities of color get the idea that Jews are trying to control black people, too. They didn't create this fantasy out of nowhere, they got it from the white people who feared it. And this is where we get to contemporary American politics. Do you remember when Donald Trump posted an image of Hillary Clinton with a Jewish star behind her, 
and then shortly after somebody shot up a pizza joint. Or maybe the time that people started thinking the Clintons were assassinating people. Or that George Soros was somehow involved in a child pornography ring. That's right. Trump and the American right wing coordinated to code Hillary Clinton as Jewish, even though she's not. And then they picked out every high ranking Jew in her campaign and pinned conspiracy theories to them. And then Pizzagate. There were lots of wild conspiracy theories suspiciously well-timed to the Clinton presidential campaign, but this one was more devastating than most, and is thought to be a precursor to the even wilder QAnon. In its basic form, there was a rumor that the emails fished out of Anthony Weiner's computer alluded to a satanic child pornography ring being run by the Clinton campaign and Democrats in general out of the basement of an independent New York pizzeria named Comet Ping Pong. Further allegations included satanic rituals, beheadings, and blood drinking. A related conspiracy theory alleged that there was video of Hillary Clinton and Huma Abedin, Wiener's wife, raping, murdering, and then drinking the adrenochrome-rich blood of a young girl to maintain their youth. Full-on Elizabeth Bathory nonsense. Surely you've noticed the similarity to our classic blood libel case here. First they take somebody with a Jewish last name, set the setting in New York City, a place famed for its high Jewish population, associate Hillary with Jewish symbolism, and then impute Satanism and ritual blood drinking to Clinton and her campaign. In this context, it sounds too ridiculous to be believable, but if you've never met a Jew in your life, If you were raised to believe in international Jewry and those evil Rothschilds and maybe even white genocide, if you think that you can't trust the mainstream media and only underground sources could possibly reveal the truth, well... In 2016, a North Carolina man drove up to New York City burst into Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria, shooting a rifle, demanding to be led to the basement so he could verify the rumors, convinced he was about to save the lives of innocent children. My friends, Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria does not even have a basement. Thankfully, no one was hurt in this particular incident, but... He was hardly the only one who believed. People have been primed for thousands of years to believe exactly this kind of nonsense. And all such conspiracy theories have now merged into QAnon, a cryptic and frankly nonsensical concatenation of gibberish being put onto the internet anonymously by One, possibly two sources, mostly believed to be some combination of the owners and operators of the website 8chan. 8chan for when 4chan just isn't fascist enough for you. QAnon believers not only buy into the Democrat and Jew-run child sex ring, blood libel, and satanic rituals, but also often believe that Trump is literally heaven-sent to clear corruption out of Washington. It'll happen any day now. The latest date that I've heard for the supposed reinstatement of the Trump administration is sometime in early August. As Zoe B. so eloquently puts it, these conspiracy theorists are not stupid. They've recognized that something is seriously wrong, and they think they've found the reason as to why. And if you believe that you alone hold the truth, 
And the truth is this dangerous? Wouldn't you want to try to save your loved ones? So they try desperately to convert people and end up pushing them away, further isolating themselves into the group where they can't afford to doubt. I, I really can't recommend her video on this enough. If you have anyone in your life who has fallen down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole and you want to try to reach them, please go watch it. It's a serious and compassionate take on the subject. And in one respect, the conspiracy theories are absolutely correct. Something is wrong, dangerously wrong. It's just no secret what it is. Corporations openly buy policies and politicians. Trump and his cronies were never in it for anything but profit. And attacking marginalized groups is nothing but a sideshow, a distraction. They're providing you a scapegoat to throw you off the scent of the real oppressors. But just like the Roman Christians, many people have a serious problem with the idea of taking any blame onto themselves, even in an abstract way. And so presented with evidence that somebody who considers themselves an upright Republican who is just opposing frivolous change has actually participated in genocide? Well, they can't accept that. So they double down and they stop listening to any source that conflicts with their identity. And if things should come to a final solution? Well, They've already got a scapegoat lined up. <laughs>